24, verses 13 through 16. Joshua chapter 24, verses 13 through 16. And I have given you a land for which ye did not labor, and cities which ye not built. And ye dwell in them, of the vineyards and olive yards which ye planted not, not do ye eat. Now therefore fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood, and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose ye this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It's certainly good to see you here this morning. If you don't have one of your one of the handouts, raise your hand, and one of the men in the back will give those to you. We have some visiting with us, and we are so thankful for that. If you have any questions about what you see or hear, you feel free to ask a question of uh, one of the elders or any of the members, and they will either answer the question or help you to find somebody who can. And uh, if you have a question, demand that it comes from the Word of God whenever you get that answer. Because that's one thing that we are striving to do, is just simply to do things God's way. You know, the title of the lesson this morning is, What Have They Seen in Nine House? You look, and we realize that so many people see our house, that is, our collection of members within the family. I'm not talking about the the building itself, but who we are. And you think about what the examples are that you find in God's Word. You find Noah. We're going to talk about him a bit tonight and how he had such an impact upon his family. You find Abraham, who God spoke of and said, you know, I know him, that he'll command his children after him, after God. And then you find Joshua in this text. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I mean, that's an amazing statement. I remember years back, my little baby girl, one of them, was uh, talking to me about the house in which we now live. And whenever she was little, uh, Lana and I, we looked and we realized that one day Lana would get quite a bit older and she'd need some place to live. But we talked about we might need to buy a house in another location so that we could have one of our own, that we could have the confidence that we could be there. Well, things have turned out to where we now own that house, but at that point, we didn't know. But Mary got upset that somebody else would live in that abode where she'd grown up. She didn't think anybody else should live there going to be a problem whenever Lana and I pass. I don't know what's going to happen, but uh, it's going to have to sit vacant, I guess. But it caused me to think about, you know, what does she associate with this? And I know it's not the physical dwelling itself. It's who has been there and what we've done. You know, that's what we need to consider. Whenever we look at our home, we see that God, He instituted the home. It was the first of three divinely ordained institutions, the family and government and the church that are set forth. But it's God who began that first family with Adam and Eve. And he set forth a pattern that we can live in such a way that we're not afraid of what other people have seen in our house. What are the memories that they see as they come? I consider that about my children, my grandchildren. I consider that about you. Most of you have been in my home. If not, you're welcome to come over there to see us as we are, you know, me out of the pulpit. And I do have a life in which I am not behind the pulpit. And so, you know, you're welcome to come to see what it's like. And I hope that you would be impressed, that you would see that I have been a Joshua. 
and that I have a helpmate, that is one who is a corresponding part, who has enabled us to have a home in which we have determined our house will serve the Lord. But I know, too, that whenever that is done, that there are things that people see. And I'm going to give you some things that I hope that have been seen by those who have been a part of my family, which encompasses many of you. But I hope that you have seen certain things. But the emphasis that I hope you've seen isn't that I did it my way. I don't have some special insight. I don't have some divine intervention that comes to me that makes me do things. I make decisions, Lana makes decisions, as to what we're going to do. And I hope that what has been demonstrated for our children, our grandchildren, for any who have been at our home, who have seen and been a part of it, that we didn't do it our way. That we have determined that we will follow Him, follow Jesus. I'm glad Caden chose that song. And so it is a life then that if that is so, I pray that my children, my grandchildren, and others have seen that the kingdom was put first. In Matthew the 6th chapter, in verse 19 and following, the Lord speaks about that we can't serve God and mammon. The world gives you the idea you can go with one foot out in the world and then, oh, it's church time, so I'm going to go over here and I'm going to seek God now. doesn't work that way. He says you do that and you'll love the one and hate the other. And In actuality, whenever you try to divide your time, live in the world and give a little to God, you've already demonstrated that your true God is the world. You've relegated the God of heaven somewhere out there. A part-time thing that maybe you need, maybe you don't. But we need to be seen that the kingdom is put first. And that's a cost. It is something that sadly in our world brings about the aspect, the truth, that life isn't fair. I've talked about that before, how especially my son, you know, he got, it didn't take him long to realize he's not going to come home and say, Dad, it's not fair. Because I told him somebody lied to you if they told you life was fair. But you look and you realize that living the Christian life, God never said it's going to be fair. He did say that there is a hope beyond this land of party. I mean, you know, we, we look beyond here. But in this life, you make the decision, Hebrews 10 and verse 25, not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. <clears throat> you look at the people here. I mean, this is Christmas Day. Christmas Day is special at our house. The time of family. We have smiles just like Avery gave me. <laughs> I mean, the joy of being together. You know, it's just so, the build up to it. Last night they were over and we had the telescope out looking around. I mean, we do all sorts of things. And it's a wonderful thing. The world looks, and of course, they put a different spin on Christmas. Last night, my uh, little girl, Avery, she said, pop you need to tell people that Jesus wasn't born on Christmas Day. And, you, you know, what I need to tell people, you know, I have people who come to me and they say, oh, you're really busy this time of year, aren't you, because of Christmas. And I say, well, you know, no. <laughs> I mean, we got a lot of family things going on. Well, I mean, at the church, you know, you're getting all these things ready for Christmas. No, it's nothing special. And they look. You want, me to, you want me to give you something you can ask people? And it stops them. They don't know what to say. They usually turn around and say, well, you, you just don't, you don't love Christ or whatever. But ask them, can you show me in the Bible where there is a celebration of Christ's birth? Now, Colossians 3 and verse 17 says that whatever we do in word or deed, we're to do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks unto God the Father by Him. Do it in His name. If we speak, we're to speak as the oracles of God, 1 Peter 4 and verse 11. Where in the Bible 
do you find a holy celebration of Jesus' birth? I've asked people that, and they've responded in anger to me. They've responded in indifference. They've well, you just don't want to talk about it. Well, or they say, my church always has, my family always has. You know, the Lord said in Matthew 15 and verse 9, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines, commandments of men. I can't have that attitude, as for me and my house will serve the Lord, and then I'm going to go and do things the world's way. You know what, do I stand in awe of Christ's birth? You better believe it. I teach my children, my grandchildren that. I mean, this is that. I mean, how many times do you see that in reference to Jesus Christ? It was fulfilled. His birth fulfilled multitudes of prophecies. We had a lady here, sadly passed away not long ago, Thomasine Rivert. I could ask how many of you through the years told her happy birthday on her birthday. And I would imagine there might be two or three people. You know why? She didn't want anybody to. She didn't want to be that center. She didn't want people to celebrate her birthday. Do you know what she did? She didn't tell people when her birthday was. If God wanted us to celebrate Christmas as a religious day, as the birth of Christ, don't you think he would have told us when it was? Now, I can demonstrate in the Bible. I'm not going to do it, but I can demonstrate that it is not this time of year. But it really doesn't matter because God doesn't want us to do that. But back to the point of family, you're here today. A lot of people in a religious world, they say, well, we went to Mass or something last night or we're going to have an abbreviated service. And then my son said people have asked him, you know, you, you really have evening services on Christmas? And he looked at me and he said, how do those people who say this is such a holy celebration, they cut out times at which they worship God? Well, our children. I raised a daughter, a son. I've seen them raising my grandchildren. And I've seen the struggles that it takes to be trained to make decisions according to God's will, not the way of the world. It's hard on children as they, you know, they have a play at school. And they're told, you can't be part of this because this is a religious thing. We're not going to do that. But it doesn't stop there. I mean, you make decisions to live this life, to put the kingdom first, whether it be on a day like today or any other religious day that the world conceives of. But whenever you make that decision, the world doesn't understand why, you know, it's a championship game, but you don't go. Why? Because I have worship at that time. I mean, you know, and it goes on until you get older. There is not an age group that isn't affected by a decision in a home to put the kingdom first. It begins with attendance. You assemble with the saints. Even whenever the religious world incorporates things that would interfere with that, you make the decision in your home to follow God. Not the gods of the world, but the true and living God and what he has revealed in his word. You make a decision that you're going to have seen in your home that you're a part of the church. It's not just 45 minutes on Sunday morning and I'm done. It's not an hour and a half on Sunday morning and I'm done. It's not an hour and a half there and then in an evening and in Wednesday. But I'm involved within the work of the church. Do your children see that in your home? Do your neighbors see that? Do they see that we understand the body is built it up under the edifying of itself in love by that which every joint supplies, Ephesians the fourth chapter, verse 16, and that's you and I. We are the suppliers of that which holds the church and puts it forth to this world. We are the ones in Galatians 6 and verse 9 who don't grow weary in well-doing, knowing that we shall in due season reap. I mean, you know, we will do that if we faint not. 
We don't stop working. You know, our children ought to see in our homes, our neighbors ought to see in our homes, our fellow Christians ought to see in our homes that we're going to be at worship service. We're going to be involved. We're going to be studying the Bible. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Why? Because there are people who are going to add to it, take away from it, twist it, distort it. I want to make sure that I know what the Word of God says. Not only so I can pattern my life after it, but I can, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, I can teach it to others. Do you ever think about this world? Our children, our families, live in a world in which we are looked at as so odd because we want to do things according to that book. What must I do to be saved? 39th Street is church row. That's what I was told when I moved here. And you can see, drive up and down it. I have gone up and down. I remember one time I did a study on denominational doctrines for a class I was teaching. I went to each building and I asked them various questions about worship, about how to be saved. All of them different. And then I would ask them, why would you teach that if the Bible says that? And it would go back to our catechism, our church discipline, the episcopy, the head of the church. And I said, but aren't we supposed to follow this? Some of them call me a legalist. Guilty. <laughs> I want to do things God's way. But we live in a world in which our children are ridiculed by that. You get to the purity of life, 1 Peter 2 and verse 11. This morning there was a discussion on drinking. You know, our children are brought up. You know, somebody comes to my house and they bring a bottle of wine. It never happened. But if they did, I'd do just as. I've been with my family at restaurants and they'll say, okay, we have this wine. And invariably, one of the family members will turn and say, we don't drink. Why? <laughs> well, they don't normally ask that because all they're interested in, well, they're not going to buy this bottle of wine, so there goes part of my tip. But if somebody comes and offers you a drink, young people, offers you a cigarette, offers you some other drug, they begin to speak kind of off color. They do that when you're young. It gets worse whenever you go to work, doesn't it? You get in the workplace, and there it is. Do you tell them, I, I don't do that. I don't, I don't talk like that. I don't take those things. I don't do that. Why? Because God said we're to abstain from the fleshly lust at war against the soul. We're to be living a life, James 1 and verse 27, that's pure and unspotted from the world. I don't live like that. And man, that brings problems. But hopefully we raise our children. They see it in the home, and they don't use this little ploy that's used not only with young folk, but older folks. Well, my parents my church. No, it's a decision that we make because we have decided to follow Jesus. We've decided to seek the kingdom first. I don't want to drink. I don't want to smoke. I don't want to cuss. I don't want to tell off-color jokes. I don't want to dress in an ungodly fashion to fit in with the world. I'm not to be conformed to the world, Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. But it's hard. You know what? my children, your children have seen in our homes if we live the way that God says, if we determine to seek the kingdom first, they've seen that, you know what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 13 and 14? There's a narrow way that leads to eternal life and few there be that find it. There's a broad way that leads to destruction and many go in thereby. They've seen that. And they know the truth of 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12. If you live godly in Christ Jesus, you're going to suffer persecution. Well, hopefully it will be that people will ask, why? And you'll be ready to give an answer. Remember, you're a Bible student. So you'll be ready to give an answer to them about the hope that's in you. 
But the reality is, I, like I said at the beginning, you know, kids come home, say it's not fair. I never told you it was going to be fair. God never said it was going to be fair. People are going to treat us bad because of good things we do. Now, there's good people out there. Even if they're not members of the church, they're good people. They'll say, well, you know, I've had people come up to me and thank me for offering a prayer at a restaurant. I've had people thank me for turning around and telling somebody, don't talk like that. I mean, there are people who want good things in life. They're not willing to make the full commitment to do things God's way. But the sad thing is, how much of what religious folks you see are that same way? You could go back to the holiday. Well, I'm going to celebrate Christmas. Can you find it in the Bible? No, but I'm going to do it anyway because... And you start giving excuses. Or I don't see anything wrong with this little drink or smoking this cigarette or everybody cusses a little bit. Don't care what the Bible says. In other words, I don't mind choosing God first as long as we don't carry it too far. How can you carry choosing God first too far? We make a decision to follow Him. We make a decision, 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 and 22, to prove all things, hold fast to that which is good, abstain from the very appearance of evil. That's what I hope has been seen in my home. What I hope has been seen in your home. If not, we need to repent because God said that's what you do. You seek the kingdom first. And then, what do they see? You know, well, I seek the kingdom first. What about love? Love is something, that's a, a defining mark of being a child of God. John 13 and verse 35, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Is that a defining point in my life? What about in my home? What have they seen between me and their mother? Do we love each other? Love means more than just, I love you, now get out of my way. Love is something, in Ephesians 5, the husband loves his wife as his own body. He loves and cherishes her. It's a love that is more than just a, a emotional thing in Titus the second chapter you find where the older women are to teach the younger women to love their husbands and children what does that mean it means it's more I mean there is a mother's love for a child that's born a mother's love for that husband is amazing but it is demonstrated that's what's taught you go to first Corinthians the 13th chapter there the love chapter verse 4 through 8 and the word in the King James is charity. It is love. It's that deepest, strongest love that Jesus set forth is so much different. Take the time sometime to read that and see, is that's what's demonstrated in my home, one toward another? And yeah, it needs to be worked on with brothers and sisters. It needs to be worked on parent to child, child to parent. But even that, it goes out. Whenever... I'm driving down the road. Somebody cuts me off. You know, the world's going crazy. The other day in Arkansas, woman wasn't moving fast enough. Man gets out, shoots in the car. I don't know. I'm sure he's going to say, I didn't mean to hurt anybody. What do you expect whenever you shoot a gun at somebody? small child hit by that bullet idiots are out there but you know what the problem is love if you love somebody you're not going to do that somebody says well I don't have to worry about it. and you know the chances of that happening to you minuscule but you know the chances of somebody talking to you in a fashion just dressing you down with the words 
Is that love? You know, road rage, <coughs> it can come in all different fashions. That rage towards others and how I release that, how I treat them. Can I look at God and say, you know, I'm glad that the world sees this. They know that I have love one for another. We need to think about our words. We need to think about our actions. What have they seen in my house? What have my children seen? What has my wife seen? I know all of us could work well. I know I can work on that. Then, hospitality, concern for others. Hebrews, the 13th chapter, we're to give hospitality towards another. I mean, that's, you know, the way we treat others, the way that we owe others that love spoken of in Romans, the 12th chapter, James 1 and verse 27, to visit the fatherless and the widows. In other words, we see people and we see the needs. We, sometimes it's an emotional need. Arm around the shoulder, a hug, a word of comfort, a word of encouragement, a word of, I'm sorry, I wish I could do something. Maybe helping them with the needs they have physically, helping with the needs they have spiritually. But all of these things, this is what ought to be seen in our life. Galatians 6, verse 1 and 2. There he says, Brethren, if, if you see one who's overtaken in a fall, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. You notice there are only two classes there. Either I'm a helper or I'm in need of help. There's not a middle ground. Somebody says, well, that's just not my style. I, I don't really help others. Well, then you need to be helped in that regard. There isn't a middle ground. That isn't an A, B, or C. It's either or. And so I live that life. I'm ready, in verse 10, to do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. You know, they say charity begins at home, and that's, that's true. Galatians 6 and verse 10. I have a special responsibility to my physical family. Then my responsibility goes to my spiritual family. Then my responsibility goes out. But as I have opportunity, I'm to do good unto all men. I'm to be there. You know, a sounding board? You know, I, I feel so sorry for, for Jackie. Uh, laying in a hospital bed flat on her back. You know, I, I don't know how she does I can't do that. I lay on my back a little bit, and then I start hurting in all sorts of ways. I, I can't. I guess I could if they said, well, if you don't, well, this is what's going to happen to your back. But I feel sorry for her. And I told her the other day when I was at the hospital, I said, if you need somebody to call and just yell at, give me a call. I don't care whether it's middle of the night or whatever. And she just laughed, said, oh, you wouldn't? And I said, no, I'm serious. I said, I'd rather you yell at me than to take out one of the nurses. <laughs> you know, the frustrations get great at times. And sometimes we need to be there. You know, it can be in the home. You know, if it weren't for Lana putting up with me and, you know, helping me as I deal with frustrations, I would probably be in jail someplace. But she helps me. Whenever God said it's not good that man should be alone, that's the foreknowledge of God. He looked at Jack and said, don't let him be alone. <laughs> but it can be in the home. It can be amongst Christians. But you look. That's who we are. You know, our family ought to see that whenever somebody's in need, somebody may need a place to be during a certain time. Somebody needs just to be around other people. Somebody needs a hand up. They need to see and just be told that's who we are. It's what we do because we decided to follow Jesus. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You have people in. I remember my father-in-law was up here once and he was looking, and of course, well, part of that was Jeff Grisham's fault. But he said, this is like Grand Central Station. And he said that after Jeff Grisham walked in the house without walking, 
without knocking, walked up the stairs, walked across the living room. Here I sat with my father-in-law. He didn't even look at us, say a word, went into the refrigerator, got a drink out, opened it up, came back in, sat down and said, how you doing? <laughs> my father-in-law looked like, do you know him? <laughs> but, you know, not everybody's house is that way. But in your home, do they see hospitality? We are to be given to hospitality. Who we are. We're there for one another. Is that what they've seen in, in my house? You know, today I, I look, and like I said, Christmas is a special time for me, not a religious holiday, because you can't find it in the Bible. But it's a special time for me because it's kind of, you know, a build-up. You get to the end of the year, and it's like everything's been going, then right at Christmas, it's boom, here we are, we're together in such a grand, wonderful time. And I oftentimes think, what do they sing through the year? What are my children, my grandchildren, those people who stop by? What have they seen? I hope they have seen that just like Joshua, there's been a decision in our house that we will serve the Lord. It's a decision that comes with cost. But it's a cost that's worthwhile. It's a cost that you're ready to pay because you have that hope that's an anchor of your soul. We know that this isn't all there is, but you know, whenever you live it God's way, whenever you seek God first, it is an amazing way. But it's just a taste of what's to come. So you look and you see, what have they? You know, I look at you, what have you seen in my house? I hope that you have seen, I have decided, me and my family, to follow Jesus. And I hope that if, if that wasn't so, that I would have the love for God, the love for self, the love for others to make that decision. Because if I'm not following Jesus and he's at the right hand of the Father, where do you think I'm going? You don't even have to have the verse, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If I'm not following him, I'm not going to be with him. So I'd hope that I have the concern for myself, for my family, for you, for others, to make that decision to say, you know, I've made some mistakes in my life, but right now I'm going to follow Jesus. And you know where that's going to lead you? He came into this world, and you know, Again, you know, the world at this time, you would think that 90% of the Bible is about a baby laying in a manger. Small little part of the Bible. But what you find is that baby, as he fulfilled these prophecies, his parents ultimately took him to the temple at 12 years old. And whenever he was there, they left, and he wasn't with them. They went back, and he was in the temple talking about God and he said know you not that I must be about my father's business sound familiar as for me and my house we'll serve the Lord Jesus came his meat was to do the will of the father which is in heaven he set forth that way do what God says and then he left instructions you want to be saved I think we understand. Being with Jesus, being saved, one and the same thing. You know what Jesus said about being saved? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. Pretty simple, isn't it? So I says, well, you know, that's your interpret. No, <laughs> that's what the verse says. If you're baptized based upon your faith in other places, he taught. Except you repent, you shall likewise perish. You must confess me before others. 
I mean, you look, and God's way of being with him, of beginning that step of following him, is to put that old man of sin to death. That's me when I chose to do things the world's way. But he says in Romans, the sixth chapter, he says, God be thanked, you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. By the way, that does away with the idea there's nothing you can do. God didn't know that. You obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine is delivered unto you, being then made free. When? When you obeyed that will. Well, what had the Romans done? You go to the first of that chapter. They were baptized into Christ, baptized into his death, that old man of sin was put to death. They rose to walk in the newness of life. They decided to follow Jesus. And then they live like it. If that's not us, somebody's seeing something in our house that they shouldn't. I want my children, my grandchildren, I want all of you, I want anybody who comes into contact with me to be able to look and say, you know, there's, that's a home that followed Jesus. Not because of who we are, but because of what he said. They can look at that word, they can look at our decisions, and they might not like it, but they cannot deny it successfully. Is that your decision? What do they say to thine house? question all of us might not ask, but it's answered every day of our life by those with whom we come into contact. First of all, those in your own family. As for me and my house, we've decided to follow Jesus. What about you? As we stand and sing the song of invitation.